Welcome to part two of a four-part series on the economic ties that shape nations. Today we continue from where we left off last time. The story takes an intriguing turn when we consider the allegations of France's strategic interference in the ECOWAS initiative. Critics allege that the WEMU's adoption of the ECO, in its form and timing, was a calculated move to disrupt and co-opt the broader ECOWAS vision, ensuring the prolongation of France's influence in the region. This perspective paints a picture of a power play, a chess game of economic interests where the move to rename the CFA franc to the ECO was not a step towards decolonization, but rather a rebranding of existing power structures. The implications of this are profound. If the allegations hold true, the move could be seen as a significant setback for the aspirations of regional economic sovereignty and integration championed by ECOWAS. It raises critical questions about the nature of post-colonial relationships and the real meaning of economic partnerships. Are these partnerships truly mutual, or are they veiled continuations of a colonial power dynamic? Critics allege that the WEMU's adoption of the ECO, in its form and timing, was a calculated move to disrupt and co-opt the broader ECOWAS vision, ensuring the prolongation of France's influence in the region. This perspective paints a picture of a power play, a chess game of economic interests where the move to rename the CFA franc to the ECO was not a step towards decolonization, but rather a rebranding of existing power structures. As we unpack these layers, it's crucial to understand the impact on the ground. The persistence of the CFA franc and the conditions attached to it have tangible implications for the economic realities of millions. From the farmer in the fields of Burkina Faso to the entrepreneur in the bustling markets of Abidjan, the currency they use and the economic policies that govern it shape their daily lives, their business decisions, and their future prospects. This is not just a tale of high-level economic policies and international agreements. It's a story about aspirations, about the quest for a future where the nations of West Africa can steer their own economic ship, free from the shadows of a colonial past. The echoes of history reverberate through these actions, reminding us of previous instances where colonial powers sought to maintain their influence by disrupting the aspirations of their former subjects. A notable example is Patrice Lumumba, the first democratically elected prime minister of the Congo. Lumumba's vision for a united, sovereign Congo posed a threat to the interests of colonial Belgium and its allies. His efforts were met with covert operations and support for rival factions, ultimately leading to his tragic assassination. Lumumba's story is a poignant reminder of the lengths to which colonial powers have gone to preserve their interests, casting a shadow over the legitimacy of their post-colonial engagements. And Lumumba's story is not an isolated incident. Across continents, from Africa to Asia, the pattern repeats. Leaders like Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso, who sought economic and social reforms, faced resistance and ultimately met tragic ends. These narratives paint a broader picture of the struggle for true sovereignty and self-determination, a struggle often marred by external interference and internal strife, fueled by the lingering grasp of former colonial powers. The parallels between these historical episodes and the current situation with the CFA Frank and the ECO are stark raising questions about the true intentions behind economic policies and reforms. Amidst the discourse on the lingering effects of colonialism, a narrative emerges from some corners of Europe, seeking to distance individual and national responsibility from the colonial past. Assertions are made that certain families never reaped the benefits, or that ancestors stood in opposition to colonial endeavors. Yet, this perspective overlooks the collective nature of colonial gains, where the wealth extracted was often funneled into public infrastructure and national development, bolstering economies across Europe. Governments of the time, much like they did with the pirates and privateers from the 16th through the 18th century, were not mere spectators, but active participants and endorsers of colonial exploits. This narrative of dissociation fails to acknowledge the systemic and pervasive nature of colonialism and its benefits, which were intricately woven into the fabric of national growth and development, leaving a complex legacy of collective responsibility that extends beyond individual or family involvement. 
Thank you for joining us on this part 2 of the journey through the complex narrative of the CFA Franc, its ties to France, and the quest for monetary sovereignty in West Africa. Stay tuned for more deep dives into the stories that shape our world.